Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, so, I'll come to you uh, with a bit of a Friday read slash mid-month reading update. Um, I, it's weird, it feels weird calling this Friday read since it's like, I haven't done Friday reads the past few weeks. So really, this is sort of a, a bit of a wrap-up of the first part of the month. Although, I'm not going to talk about all the books I've read. Um, well, actually, I'm going to be talking about all but one because um, aside from the books I'm going to talk about in this um, video, I have only read one book, which is... Um, Curtis Kate's biography of Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, which I made a video about, so I'll leave a link to that if you if you care to check out my thoughts on it, but I didn't think it was really worth it to talk about this more in depth, because I did a whole video about it, so I'll leave a link to that. Um, but other than that, I'm going to talk about the books that I have finished since that book, and the books that I'm currently working on. It is a serious irony that a few weeks after I uh, said in a video that I need to read only one book at a time, that uh, I am now reading uh, about six books, uh, but I guess that's just how life goes. I don't know. But um, I'm going to start with the worst book that I've read this month. One of the worst books I've read all year. One of the worst books I've read in my entire life. I absolutely hated this book. And I talked about it in the video just last week. It's um, Ingenious, The Unintended Consequences of Human Innov Innovation by Peter Gluckman and Mark Hansen. What this book is about is about how... Um, modern innovations in technology and the availability of food and the internet and such um, are great for sort of short-term survival benefit because we have you know we have access to food so we can survive um, we our lives are more convenient now that we can you know drive places or fly places or and such and contact people really easily through email and such um, and the internet is great because you know we get to stay really connected with people um, but all of that can have unintended consequences, right? Um, you know, we have rising obesity rates because of the availability of food, um, we're addicted to our phones, yada yada yada. And this book kind of talks about that, about that sort of trade-off of how um, technological advances can have harmful effects. Um, and um, it, it was just a terrible book. Um, basically because I don't feel like it says anything new about any of those things. Uh, and because I think it says those things terribly. <laughs> um, you know, all the points that they make in this book about the perils of modern innovation, of, you know, artificial intelligence, the possible collapse of democracy, which is in part brought about by the rise of the internet and such, rising obesity rates, all of it is stuff that if you even vaguely keep up with, you know, the news, uh, or just modern culture, you'll probably have heard about and have heard about in just about as much detail as they are able to go to in a book that's not even that long. Um, so there just wasn't really that much in this book that was particularly new. And the writing was like, sort of like these two guys who are used to probably, used to writing uh, academic articles for scholarly journals. They're both, I believe, academics. Um, Peter Gluckman is University Distinguished Professor and Director of the Center for Science and Policy, Diplomacy and Society at the University of Auckland. So yes, he's an academic. And Mark Hansen um, is at the University of Southampton. So they're academics. And this just feels like people who are used to writing nothing but academic articles trying to write a popular press book and really failing at it. Uh, the prose is just completely inert and dry and it just makes the book horribly boring. Um, and yeah, I would not recommend it. I, I really didn't like it. And I don't really want to talk about it anymore. Because the second book that I read this month, I actually finished this book before I finished uh, Ingenious, and it was a much better reading experience. It's uh, The Thebaid by Statius. Um, this is an, a Roman epic poem for, that was written in 90 AD, about 100 years after Virgil's Aeneid. Um, Statius um, is not very well known today. He has really fallen into obscurity today, but in his time he was like a bestseller. He was really well known, uh, he was studied in schools, um, all the way from when this book w and his other poems, he was also a lyric poet who wrote shorter verses, um, all the way from his own lifetime up through the Middle Ages, he was really revered and studied as like one of the great Roman writers, like up there with, you know, Virgil and Ovid and, uh, and Homer even. Um, uh, and, you know, the way that I found out about Statius was through reading Dante's Divine Comedy, which incidentally is a book I'm going to be talking about in a minute. Um, because in the Divine Comedy, Statius actually appears for uh, a little while in the, the Purgatory section of, of, the, of the comedy. He leads Dante through a section of Mount Purgatory. 
um, because it, because in the Middle Ages they believed Statius to be a Christian, to be sort of a secret Christian, uh, because of the sort of um, uh, lessons of compassion that uh, cri that Christians at the time saw in his work, in particular in the Thebaid. Um, and so what the Thebaid, Thebaid is about is it is about the uh, Seven Against Thebes. So um, after Oedipus, um, you know, after it came out that he had, you know, killed Laius and um, slept with his own mother, uh, he was no longer able to be king of Thebes because he was the murderer of the king um, and the guy who was causing the plague uh, being cursed from the gods. Um, and so once Oedipus stepped down, what, w what was decided in Thebes was that Oedipus's two sons, Eteocles and Polynices, would be alternate kings. Um, one would rule for a year and then step down, the other would rule for a year and then step down, and the other would come back and rule for a year, and so on and so forth. Um, but what happens at the beginning of the Thebaid is that Eteocles um, decides he, he doesn't want to go along with that. He just wants to um, stay king permanently. He banishes Polynices. Um, and Polynices is obviously angry about that, and so he enlists the help of um, Argos, uh, a neighboring kingdom, and um, brings this whole army to bear on Thebes to take back his throne, uh, throne that he sees as rightfully his. Um, and this tells the story of that war. Um, and there's a huge cast of characters. Actually, a lot of the characters in here only appear for um, a few pages uh, and just sort of get one... Uh, small incident surrounding them uh, before they're never heard from again. Um, even though this does have that frame story of the Seven Against Thebe, I do feel like it can be read a lot like something like Ovid's Metamorphoses, where there's also sort of a, a through line of narrative, uh, but on the whole it's really just an excuse for Ovid to tell um, many different stories, and I feel like the, the, the this is written in a similar vein. Um, it tells... Um, Many different stories along the way in this war, uh, this civil war in Thebes. Um, and, uh, it's, I can see why it has kind of fallen out of favor, uh, in, um, among the, in the literary canon. Um, I think that Statius never says in, you know, one verse what he could say in, like, 20 verses. Um, you know, everyone speaks in monologues, everything is described for, uh, 20 verses a piece with, you know, a couple different similes to, to describe it. Um, he's not a concise writer, it can come off as a bit pompous and a bit sentimental, perhaps, at times. Um, the characters aren't real people in the, in the sense of being three-dimensional characters like you find in a lot of other ancient writers. Um, they're more like characters from opera, uh, really. Um, they're very sort of over-the-top. Uh, you know, waxing poetic when you know that no real person would wax poetic in the way these characters do. Um, but uh, that didn't kill my enjoyment of it. I actually did really end up liking it. I think it is a, a compelling anti-war tale. Um, it really is in large part about the kind of stupidity of civil war and war in general and the effects that war has on people and uh, you know how it leads to so much misery. Um, it doesn't deal with that subject very subtly at all, uh, but I think it does convey that sense of the horrors of war pretty, um, powerfully in a couple instances. In other instances, not so much. But, I ended up liking it. I, I won't say that it's some sort of, you know, forgotten gem that you should all go read because it's the real classic of Roman literature, uh, by any means. I can see why it's not as well regarded now as it once was. Um, but I did like it. So if you're, you know, if you're into classical Greek and Roman literature and you perhaps exhausted the you know, usual uh, avenues, then maybe this will be an interesting one for you to pick up. Um, and I think I'll probably be rereading at some point in the future. So, uh, I, yeah, I'm really glad I read this. Next is uh, God Emperor of Dune by Frank Herbert. Um, this is the fourth novel in the Dune saga. Uh, Dune Tube is still plowing ahead. I bowed out for Children of Dune, much to my shame, uh, because it was just too soon since I'd read Children of Dune for the last time to reread it again in such short order. Um, but this is my first time reading God Emperor of Dune, uh, and I am finding it very interesting. Um, I can't quite say that I'm loving it yet. Um, it's very engaging, it's very dense, there's a lot of, I feel like a lot of complex ideas infused into it about humanity and politics and such, and religion of course, um, and I feel like there's a lot of complex political machinations going on in it that um, I just sort of need to process really slowly. Um, 
And so I'm reading it very slowly. I've been reading it for almost this entire month, and I'm only halfway through it. Even though, it, I mean, it, it's not an unsubstantial book, but it's not a super long book. So it's taken me a surprisingly long time to get through it. Um, so it's slow going. I am enjoying it. Uh, I will be making a video of it for DuneTube. I don't know if I'm going to meet the um, 20th of the month deadline, which was our original deadline for DuneTube videos, but I will be getting a video out before the end of the month. Um, so I'll be talking about it more in another video. Next up is uh, Why I Read by Wendy Lesser. The subtitle is The Serious Pleasure of Books. Um, kind of a dull title, unfortunately, but this is a really nice book. I'm uh, about a third of the way through it. And um, yeah, I mean, that title tells you everything you need to know about the book. Um, but what I like about this is she doesn't just talk about fiction, which a lot of these books do. She talks about um, essays, memoirs, poetry, um, and just great insights all along the way. You know, not all the insights are new or that original, but they're just so well put. Um, and with a lot of, you know, humor and wit that I enjoy reading them anyway, as I always enjoy, uh, books about books. And I will say that Wendy Lesser did something that I didn't think any author would be able to do, which is she actually made me want to try reading mysteries. Um, in particular, she talks briefly about Patricia Highsmith, um, and her, uh, novels, and she made them sound really interesting. So, um, I may be at least trying some Patricia Highsmith at some point, um, which is not something I thought anyone would ever convince me to do. So, um, I'm loving it. I, you know, I'm finding some new authors, but on the whole, it's just a great discussion of books, uh, and the love of reading in books. Um, so if you, if you're a fan of books on books, which if you're on booktube, I'm assuming you are, then, uh, that's, this is a, a recommendation. Next is a, a big thing. This is, um, The Penguin Book of English Verse. Um, so this is obviously a gigantic anthology. I've had it on my shelf for a really long time. I originally didn't think that I would read it all the way through. Um, you know, anthologies like this, often I just sort of skip around, look for poems that strike my fancy, or look for poets I know and read those, and sort of use it just as a reference to sit on my shelf for when I need it. Um, but I decided on, sort of on a whim uh, a couple weeks ago to try to actually read this cover to cover. Um, and I'm really glad I did. Um, I, 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 this is a really interesting anthology because it's arranged not by poet, which most anthologies like this are, most anthologies like this will be arranged, um, uh, you know, there'll be a section that's, um, Walt Whitman and another section that's D.H. Lawrence and another section that's, um, you know, it'll be arranged by poet. This is arranged chronologically, so you'll have the year of 1592 and the poems that are in this anthology that were published in that year will just all be sort of um, one right after the other. And yeah, 1593, 1594, and so on. And so it, it means that the all, any the poems included in the anthology by any one poet aren't all together, but they'll be juxtaposed to poets by other authors. And I think that's a really interesting way to do an anthology because it leads to really interesting comparisons between poems published in one year that you might not otherwise have seen. Um, you know, for example, I, uh, there was this one particular section, um, a brief section, which was a, um, a translation of the Book of Ecclesiastes from the Geneva Bible. Um, and so the, the you know, the Book of Ecclesiastes is all about how, you know, this world is vanity and we um, should care less about the sort of pleasures of this world and worry more about the, about the, um, uh, you know, about God and, you know, following God's commands and whatnot. Um, but then that Book of Ecclesiastes is followed by this uh, poem called Of Youth He Singeth by uh, Robert Weaver, which is this poem about, you know, young love, basically, a very sentimental look back at, uh, at, at, at this poet's younger years and how delightful they were um, basically taking pleasure in those same worldly pleasures that the passage from Ecclesiastes sort of condemns in a way. Um, and then right after that is a, a poem about death by uh, Barnaby Googe. Googie. I don't know how to pronounce his name, but it's a poem about death. So you just have these interesting juxtapositions of these Poems that you might not otherwise connect with one another. Um, so I just, I, it's a very interesting anthology, and I'm finding a lot of new poets, a lot of new poems that I'm liking. Um, and something else that I'm doing that I'm really liking, I'm reading it um, front to back, but I'm also reading it backwards to front. So I started um, at the back, which starts in uh, the 1990s. Um, so like you have Seamus Haney and uh, Paul Muldoon and some poets who are still alive and writing today um, in here. Uh, and so reading those newer poems 
uh, at the same time as reading the older poems, it's kind of cool too. You can kind of see just how far literature has come. It's a really interesting anthology, and I'm having a, I remember a really fun time reading it. The book that I have been working on this week is uh, Opera 101, A Complete Guide to Learning and Loving Opera by Fred Plotkin. Um, so I mentioned this before, uh, a while back. This is just a basic guide to opera, you know, it has a basic history of opera, it discusses, you know, what an aria is, you know, it discusses sort of uh, what to expect at a performance, how to act at a performance, etc. Um, but the the bulk of the book is taken up by um, individual chapters where Fred Plotkin um, does a sort of dissection and commentary on individual operas. Um, and there are about ten that he covers, and uh, I had already seen about five when I started the book. But um, I hadn't di dove into reading those sections because he recommends specific recordings to listen to of the operas for his particular commentaries. And in his commentaries, he makes specific reference to those specific recordings and the performers in those recordings. Um, so I had thought that I would wait to acquire all of the recordings that he suggests before I read uh, the chapters on the on the operas, even on the operas that I had um, listened to or watched. Um, but uh, then I just broke down and decided to read the chapters on the on the operas I'd seen. Uh, because this last weekend I went to see Turandot, uh, a live broadcast of Turandot at the movie theater. And it was just superb. And it just sort of um, was one of those great times where it, uh, a performance or a book uh, just reinvigorates your love of an art form. Uh, so I just had to come home and read some about opera. So I read the chapters on Tosca, one of my favorites, uh, Don Giovanni, uh, Eugene Onegin. Um, Tannhauser by Wagner, uh, Die Valkyrie, um, and Elektra, uh, by Richard Strauss. And I love all those operas a lot. I would say probably of all of them, my two favorites would probably be, uh, uh, Elektra. Well, I really love Elektra, Tannhauser, Die Valkyrie, and Tosca. And I do like Don Giovanni. I don't love it quite as much as the others, but, um, I like all of them. And it was just great. These chapters are awesome on these, uh, on these, um, on these operas. If you're looking for an introduction to opera, a way to get passionate about opera, then this would be a great recommendation. Um, and what I love about his discussions of the operas is that they're not only fun and accessible and give insights into the particular operas, they also give insights just into opera in general, but also just into storytelling in general, I feel like. You know, his commentary on operas can be applied to literature or movies or any other storytelling medium just as much as opera, and I love that. And, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm really liking this. I'm not gonna finish it now, um, because again, I, I, those five other operas that I haven't listened to or seen at all, I want to obviously, uh, watch or listen to them before I read, uh, the chapters on them. So, anyway, but I, I really enjoyed reading this. Alright, I've already mentioned Dante, but, uh, I am still chipping away at the Divine Comedy, um, so I'm reading, uh, one canto per day of this until the end of the year, hoping to, uh, reread the entire thing. And uh, reading it nice and slowly like that allows me to really just um, savor the footnotes, the end notes, and really try to g squeeze as much out of this uh, book as possible because it is, it is very dense and you know packed with literary and philosophical and historical allusions. Um, and I'm having a lot of fun just reading the end notes and getting those references and such. Um, so I'm really liking this. I don't have that much to say yet, but I, I'm enjoying getting through the Divine Comedy again. And then, um, the final book that I have to talk about is, um, A Portrait of the Artist of the Young Man, this lovely, um, Eastman Press edition. Uh, I, I'm only 30 pages into this. I haven't worked on it all that much, and I don't plan to force it until around the end of the month, because this was on my TBR for, uh, Mel over at Mel's Bookland Adventures, uh, Gone with the Book readathon where you read, uh, books published between 1900 and 1950, uh, in the last month, in the last week of September, October, and November. Um, I participated for September. I read, uh, Edith Wharton's, um, uh, <laughs> uh, Ethan Frome. I read Ethan Frome by Edith Wharton. Um, and, uh, yeah, this was another book that I put on my TBR, so I won't, I, I'm only 30 pages in, and I won't be, like, picking up the pace until then, um, and hopefully I'll have finished some of these other books by then. Um, but, uh, what I read of this, I really liked, I liked the writing, um, it's, you know, this coming-of-age story of this young boy growing up, uh, in, uh, early 1900s Ireland, and, uh, 
I relate to this young boy a lot. Um, he is very sort of introverted and reserved and sort of sheltered in a way that I feel like I was, so um, I'm relating to him quite a bit, but again, I'll have more commentary when I read more of it. And then finally, I just wanted to end out with a little announcement and a shout out. Um, so many of you may have heard of the Booktube Prize run by uh, Robert over at Barter Hordes. Um, the Booktube Prize, if, if any of you don't know, is an award that is ju a book award that is judged exclusively by booktubers uh, or people on booktube. You don't have to have a channel to judge the Booktube Prize. Um, although it, it, you are encouraged to have a channel if you're going to judge, but you, it's not a requirement. Um, and this year's prize has just wrapped up, um, and for this year, the 2019 prize, uh, the books that were eligible were only fiction, uh, but next year there is going to be a fiction and a non-fiction category. Um, so if any of you are interested in, in either of those, then I highly encourage you to go sign up. I'll leave a link to Robert's video. Um, judging a round of the Book 2 prize involves reading six books and ranking them, uh, and doing a video about your experience reading them. Uh, so it's a time commitment. I signed up for one round. I had originally signed up for two, but then I thought that's probably a bit much for me, so I took it down to one. Um, but I signed up for the uh, April-May round, so you'll be hearing about the Book 2 Prize from me then. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to give a little shout-out um, to Robert over at Barter Hordes. Um, so go check it out if you're interested, and I I'm really looking forward to it. I think it'll be a really rewarding experience. Um, so anyway, that is all. Um, I have had a pretty good, pretty productive week. I hope you all have as well, and if you haven't, then I hope uh, you recover from whatever has gone on this week over the weekend. Um, and I'll, I hope you all have a, a nice weekend. Uh, and anyway, I will talk to you all in my next video. Bye, guys.